All right, welcome back to Missing Persons TV. I'm Brian Lab with my co-host Deborah. Uh, today's Wednesday, May 13th, 2009, uh, 10:24 p.m. We're going to be discussing three old cases tonight from the year 2008. Um, there are cases 597, 598, and 599, and then we'll be discussing the uh, new case I did last night. Actually, um, we'll be dis discussing that case first. Um, but first of all, Deborah, how you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing tonight? Uh, fine. I went out uh, with my neighbor uh, Brett today. Uh, I think we worked about 14 hours out out there. Uh, it was a beautiful day out. Uh, we got a little bit of sun. Uh, we're out there pressure washing some decks and a house, um, and it was fun. Uh, definitely a change of pace. It's something I like to do. I, I love it. Um, but I uh, am a little bit tired <laughs> tonight. But I'm I'm glad we're getting this done because we need to keep doing these cases every night. Um, so you're good? Any Anything new today, Deborah? Uh, not really. Okay. It's just typical spring weather here in Michigan. Um, tulips are beautiful, though, and uh, here in West Michigan, where I live, we have the Tulip Festival going on right now, mm -hmm. and that's happening in Holland. Um, it's a really big festival. Um, it's predominantly Dutch um, in the area where I live, and so... Um, there's a whole lot of excitement in early May with the Tulip Festival when the tulips are in bloom and people from Canada and from lots of different states come. So it, it's pretty cool. We, I don't have any plans of going to it this year. Um, I have gone in past years, though. So. Yeah. I I I I tulips are cool. They don't even look real, you know, the ones that I see at least. They look like they're plastic. It's amazing how early they come up, too. Um, you know, all the different colors and everything. We have a, a apple apple butter festival here. Um, it's in it's in the fall every year. Um, a lot of people need to know about it. If you haven't, just check it out. Berkeley Springs Apple Butter Festival. Um, there's a lot of good stuff going on. Now we have a, a carnival coming up. Actually, we get two carnivals coming up, and then a state, and then a uh, county fair. Not exactly sure where our state fair is at. Probably in the capital. Okay. Um. So uh, we're all doing okay. Um, I'd like to bring in uh, one of my good friends, Kevin Doyle. I've known Kevin Doyle for a long time. Um, uh, Kevin does a lot of work for us um, uh, in, in regards to the forums and, and uh, a lot of other things. He helps us. He helps us out a lot. Um, Kevin's decided to actually help us with missing person cases, um, and I have Kevin on the phone right now, and he's going to explain exactly uh, what his uh, what he's going to be doing. Um, after we we discuss the cases and I give my dream drawing translations and all that. So Kevin, are you there? Yes, Brian, I am. I'm doing great. Hey, um, so tell everybody what you're going to be doing. Uh, basically, I'm going to try to go into a meditative state of being while you guys are discussing the cases amongst yourselves. And what I've done, what I'm going to do is after you and Deborah have said everything you've had to say about uh, the case, one case at a time, by the way, I'm going to have you call my name, you know, basically Kevin, which is the code word for me to, to wake up a little bit out of my state of mind so that I can try to uh, bring in some new information concerning the cases. Um, I'm not saying that I, I have a spirit guide or anything like that. This is just my way of trying to uh, trying to bring in some new information. Uh, call it psychic or uh, ESP, whatever you want. It's uh, it's it's an ability that everybody has. And uh, like I said, you and Deborah can discuss the cases. I won't be involved in any of the conversations per se, except when you you know say something like to the effect of Kevin, are you there? Or Kevin and uh, Give me a second or two, Brian, and then I can start talking and tell you if I've come up with anything. Also, Brian, if uh, if as long as you're talking about a case for at least, I would say, a minute or two, so I can at least have some time to go into a meditative state. Uh, I, I've never really timed you guys talking about cases, so... Um, I just thought about that right now, you know, I can't automatically go into a meditative state. It's kind of like whenever you do your dreams, um, I guess, sort of say. So uh, we'll just go from there and see what happens, and hopefully we can uh, we can all do some wonderful things together. 
Okay, well, you've answered some of the questions that I was going to ask you. One of them, are you psychic? Um, and um, you, we discussed the word psychic, you know, before. Um, personally, I think everybody is psychic, and, and the word psychic is really you know, pr pretty vague. And um, I think if you, if you look up the word psychic on um, Wikipedia, uh, it tells you people would... Uh, apparently, uh, ESP, extra sensory perception gifts and stuff like that. Personally, I think that we're all psychic, um, and I think that we all can do anything we set our mind to. Um, people that claim that say they're psychic or claim them psychic are psychic, I believe. Um, and we, we just maybe are more in tune to our natural rhythms or whatever than some other people or whatever. I don't consider myself to be psychic. I have to be asleep or in a hypnotic state. Um, and what I do um, is something everybody can do because we're all in those states, um, especially you know, you know your dreaming states, your different phases, your delta phase, and all that other stuff. Um, and then um, hypnotic state when you wake up and, uh, as you're falling asleep, and when you wake up, and a lot of people call that lucid state. And I do a lot of uh, a lot of work sometimes in lucid state. And I'm actually um, halfway awake and halfway asleep, kind of like I think what you're talking about, Kevin. So basically, yeah. you're kind of doing what what I do when what I'm doing. Let's say a, a, like a lucid. Uh, lucid type of remote viewing or whatever you want to call it. Oh, I, also, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I had I forgot to say this. I'm also uh, recording myself live on uh, UStream as as we do this. As you yeah, do I was, 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 was going to bring with, that up with Deborah. And I, what I have is some organ devices that I make. I'm showing them in the video right now. Okay. But uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to place them on my chakras as I'm laying, lean, leaning back in my uh, lazy boy recliner here, and uh, that's about it. Okay. Um, so if you guys are on, uh, uh, if you, you're in our chat room right now and you see me, um, uh, if you want to jump over to Kevin's room, we're, that's cool, um, and see what Kevin's actually doing. Um, and it's the same chat room, um, and you should still be able to hear us. Uh, you don't need to see me anyways. <laughs> okay, but... Um, cool. Yeah, and by the way, I won't be able to talk to anybody in the uh, COA chat room until after the show. We realize that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try not to involve you at all until till the end of the case. Kevin, I'm going to treat you like any other psychic that we have on. Um, so we'll bring you up last. And I, um, I have my notepad right here. Um, would you like me to take some notes for you, too? And, and there'll be, I know there'll be a video recording, but I'd like to do, uh, uh, when I take notes, I actually put them in the case file. Sure. How was your shorthand? It's terrible. <laughs> you haven't you seen? <laughs> have you seen my website? <laughs> Come on yes. now. I, it's, I, I can't read, write, draw, whatever. But at least at least I'm trying. Um, but I did want to bring up the psychic thing again. Um, I, I think there's too many terms out there. There's too many people defining too many different things like um, psychic, spirit guides, and all this stuff like that. Um, I, I don't know. I don't have a spirit guide. I don't know if I believe in um, spirits, honestly, but um, yeah, I think anything's possible. Um, I, I go with my dreams, and, and, I, and I just take them, and I write them down, and that's what you get. Um, I think a lot of people are more in tune to what I can do when I'm sleeping. Um, and, you know, if you want to call those people psychic, that's fine. Um, but I don't know if you really want to start labeling everything. There's too, I think there's too many words. I don't know, the less words, I think, the better. Actually, I think the less thought, the less whatever, the better. Um, but like I said, keep an open mind and an open heart. And speaking of that, uh, don't forget about Clarity of Awareness, uh, which is uh, Kevin's website that um, he'll be posting his stuff on too. That's clarityofawareness.com. Um, we also will be broadcasting on our new TV network, which will be clearTVnetwork.com. Uh, um, still a little bit under construction, but you guys might get the idea of what it'll be like. Um, basically video oriented, video oriented. Uh, it's completely done in flash um, so if you haven't been to a flash site before make sure that your uh, uh, Java is updated okay Deborah I'm sorry I know you want to get to these cases are you, are you still there Deborah? Um, you do that uh, yes I'm here okay um, I'm gonna drink some water as far as you know you talked about how people call you know psychic or whatever they use a lot of different terms a lot of labels for it I like to just call it gift. Someone's right. gifted using their gift. And a big thank you to Kevin for using his gift. To yeah, thank you, Kevin. Help missing persons. Right. And, you guys. and like we said, um, we're, you know, you can think whatever you want about anybody. You can think Kevin's weird, I'm weird, whatever. Um, but at least we, we are trying uh, our best uh, uh, to help. 
um, and we will not um, judge anybody or stereotype anybody. If you have some idea uh, that you want to use, we'll be happy to have you on. I don't, I don't care what you're doing. Put tinfoil in your head for all I care. <laughs> you know, what, what, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, yeah, I think there's just too many terms for different things. And, um, you know, I think the study was 80% of America doesn't believe in psychics anyway. So, so how can you even have a definition of psychics if there's no such thing as psychics? You know, so um, a lot of people like to laugh at that kind of stuff. But, and I think there's there's too many terms, definitions, um, all these different things that um, that really we're kind of unsure about anyway. So, I said just keep your minds open, I guess, um, and then trust well, also, uh, trust also, trust your instinct. These, yeah. mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. These organ devices are what I make. Mm -hmm. And I just got in a bunch of materials to make uh, a new set of uh, organ devices. Uh, as soon as I get those made, I'll let you know, and I'll have a video to give you the, to put up on the internet and everything. Also, because I'll be uh, selling these devices as well. Okay. Once again, that's Kevin. Uh, this is Kevin Doyle's website. Um, that's ClarityOfAwareness.com. Is that correct, Kevin? Yes. Okay. Make sure I've got that right. I thought I made it up. Um, so anyways, let's get started. We have uh, three old cases. Let me just read them to you real fast, and then we'll get to the case that I did last night. Um, the first case is case number 597. Uh, this is for three people, Jane uh, Grant and Ar um, Arna Beaumont, uh, case number 598, Nancy um, McDuckson, uh, and case number 599, Mohammed Morey. Those are the three cases from 2008 that we'll be discussing. Uh, Deborah and I will be, and then Kevin will be jumping in at the end if he comes up with anything. Kevin, if you don't get anything, just say pass or whatever. I don't want to get you out of your state or whatever, because um, I know how that's like. You, you know, just say pass or or whatever, sign us or whatever, and we'll just move on. Um, okay. Okay. So the, the, what we're going to do tonight, uh, we're going we're going to start up with the, the case that I did <laughs> last night. Um, this case was actually sent to me uh, to Deborah as usual, uh, and the case uh, request came from Gail. <laughs> Gail St. John. Um, this is case number uh, 741. Let me get the graphic up really quick. Uh, this, is, this is an older case. Uh, and this is for um, uh, Lonine Ray Rogers. Um, the case was requested to be open last night. Uh, it's open today, uh, March, I'm sorry, May 13, 2009. Uh, Deborah, what information do we have for Lonine? Um, like you said, this was a request from Gail St. John mm -hmm. um, for you to work on this case. Uh, this is also the same case that she uh, featured on her broadcast this past Monday. Mm -hmm. So um, I know some of your listeners are listening to Gail's also. Uh, this is for Lonine Ray Rogers, and she's been missing since January 7th of 1981. She's missing from what they call Hayfield Township. Um, in Pennsylvania. They also refer to it as the Little Corners area and sometimes as Hatfield Township. Uh, her date of birth is October 18th, 1951, 29 years old. When she went missing, uh, she would be 40, 57 right now. Yeah, 57. Five feet, five inches tall, 140 pounds, Caucasian female, sandy brown hair, gray eyes. She has freckles and pierced ears. She has had her tonsils removed. Uh, she was last seen wearing a navy blue pea coat, blue jeans, and high brown boots. Um, as far as medical conditions, uh, she has sort of a unique one. She's almost totally deaf, and as a result of that, she is unable to speak fluently. Um, the last time she was seen was at her home, and um, this little area in Pennsylvania uh, where she's from is about 10 miles northwest of Meadville and um, the last time she was seen was in the evening. <clears throat> she had gotten into an argument with her husband that night. Uh, later that night he woke up and he realized that she wasn't there. She wasn't in the bed with him. He assumed that she was sleeping on the couch. Uh, when he woke up the next morning he realized that she was not in the house at all. Uh, Lenine left behind her hearing aids, her car, and all of her personal items. Uh, she also left behind two young children. The night that she went missing, there was a severe snowstorm. And um, her husband did not initially report her as a missing person because he 
assumed at that point that she had left on her own accord and that she would be coming back. Um, however, she was never heard from again. Uh, her husband um, is also deaf. He cooperated with the investigation and he is not considered a suspect in the case. Uh, there's been no activity on her social security number since she went missing. And there's really not a lot of, you know, evidence or um, information for this case. What do you have, Brian? Uh, thanks, Deborah. Um, I'm not exactly sure if I, if I, I agree with that. Uh, um, not there not being um, or him not being a suspect, unless it's this other other man that was talking about. Uh, the, the first stream drawing says. Um, it was self-defense. He had to kill her uh, the only way he had, and then the word poison. There's a drawing of a bottle possibly on the shelf. Um, there's some other things there. I don't quite know what they are. And the top left-hand uh, part of the screen, um, I don't have a clue what that is. Um, I don't. Uh, next dream drawing says um, uh, she's buried right next to him. Um, and I don't even think that's... Uh, I mean that could be a gravestone. I'm not sure. It's it's really really poorly drawn. Um, so honestly, I don't have a clue. But I'm I'm guessing, um, talking about him, the the man you speak you spoke of her her husband uh, may have had something to do with her death, and it might have been accidental um, or self defense. I guess there's a big difference between self defense and accidental. But um, either either way, he he could be related, or it might be a different um, person. Um, I, just, I just get the feeling that he, he is somehow related though um, and and I said that looks like a poison bottle um, but if there is a place that uh, maybe a cemetery or something that they knew of um, how old is this case again? She's been missing since 1981 okay um, you know I'm, I'm not sure Deborah that, that's all I got um, Kevin yes the um woman in question I get the feeling that she is buried in some type of woods maybe um, that's all all right Deborah thank you um, let's get this let me just scan that in there real fast um, you know, it's going to take me too much time to do that. Okay. Um, all right. Now, moving on. Uh, these are our cases uh, from um, 2008 uh, that we're going to be covering. And the first case is uh, case number 597. Um, and this is for uh, uh, Jane Grant and um, Arna Beaumont. Uh, the case was requested to be opened by Melissa on March 27th of 2007. Uh, the case was opened uh, January 12th, 2008. Uh, Deborah, uh, what, what information do we have for these people? Um, this is a really old case. This goes back to 1966. Okay. Um, Jane Beaumont uh, was nine years old at the time that she went missing. Her date of birth is September 10th of 1956. Uh, she's listed as 137 centimeters tall at that time when she went missing. Um, ear length, sun bleached, fair colored hair. And she was possibly wearing a tortoise shell hairband with a yellow ribbon on it. She has a thin face, uh, freckles, and hazel eyes, and two prominent front teeth. She was well spoken, but she stuttered when she got excited. Um, the day that she went missing, she was wearing green shorts over pink bathers. Um, she was wearing canvas sand shoes with white soles on them. Um, she should have been carrying three beach towels with her, a green Airways type bag, a white purse, and a paperback copy of Little Women. Um, let's see, there's a really cute letter that I have here. I'm going over, um, I'm getting my information on a website. Um, okay, take your time. These children are missing since um, 1966 from Australia. So it's become somewhat of a legend there. Um, she wrote a letter one night when she was taking care of her siblings. Dear mom and dad, I am just about to go to bed and the time is nine. I have put Grant's nappy on so there is no need to worry about his wetting the sheet. Grant wanted to sleep in his own bed so one of you will have to sleep with Arna. 
Although you will not find the rooms in very good condition, I hope you will find them as comfortable as we do. Good night to you both, Jane. And she put three X's and that, you know, for kisses mm -hmm. on there. P.S. I hope you had a nice time wherever you went. And P.P.S. I hope you don't mind me taking your radio into my room, Daddy. So, you know, from that letter that they have posted here on the website, um, for her age, for a nine-year-old, quite responsible and used to taking care of her siblings. Um, Arna uh, is a seven-year-old sister, seven years old at the time they went missing. Uh, sh her date of birth is November 11th of 1958. Uh, she's listed as being 122 centimeters tall and that she has a plump build, um, dark brown hair, and suntan complexion, dark brown eyes. And then Grant, uh, the little brother, four years old at the time, his date of birth, July 12th, 1961, 91 centimeters tall, thin build, brown hair, uh, brown eyes, just like both the girls, very suntanned, um, but normally has an olive type um, complexion. Um, it says here that on the day that he went missing, he was wearing green cotton shorts over green swimming trunks, um, which had vertical white stripes on them, and he was wearing red sandals. Now, I'm um, going to get to uh, another page here on the website. Um, like I said, this has become somewhat of a legend. Um, most people, um, nobody actually, nobody under the age of like 40 was alive when it actually happened, but most of the Australians um, you know, know about this. So let's see here, um, here's a, Here's a better page. This kind of chronicles what happened that day. Um, at 10.10 in the morning, January 26, 1966, um, that's the day that these three children went missing, um, the Beaumont children caught a bus to go to the beach. Uh, the bus stop was on the corner of Diagonal Road and Harding Street, which is less than 100 meters from their home. Uh, the bus driver later confirmed um, that the children did ride the bus. There was a woman passenger on the bus that had noticed them also. And later on, she was able to recall the colors of the clothes they were wearing. And that Jane, the oldest, the nine-year-old, was carrying um, a copy of Little Women with her. Um, the bus um, took a route up northwest along Diagonal Road and then north on Brighton Road um, before it turned to the left to go west along Jetty Road. Um, from Jetty Road, it stopped at Mosley Street, and that was uh, very close to the beach that they had been going to that day. Um, at about 10.15 that morning, it was a fairly short bus ride, they got off the bus there at the beach. Um, over the course of like 45 minutes after that, so from about 10.15 to 11, um, they're not quite sure what the children were doing. Um, but they, they think that they were probably swimming during that time. At about 11 in the morning, a 74-year-old woman was sitting in front of the Holdfast Sailing Club, and she was sitting on a bench underneath some trees. She saw the three Beaumont children playing under a sprinkler on the lawn of the Collie Reserve. Uh, she saw a man who was wearing blue swimming trunks lying face down on the grass, he, it looked like he was watching the kids. And uh, about 15 minutes after that, she saw that man playing with the children. And they were flicking him with their towels. At about 11.45, the three Beaumont children entered a nearby, they call it a milk bar, so I, I don't know if that's like an ice cream shop or like a soda shop. And it says that they bought some pa pasties and a pie and um, they went ahead and they paid for those and they were supposed to be catching the bus again at noon. Um, at about noon, another woman saw them and she was sitting on another nearby bench. Um, on that bench was also an elderly couple who saw them. And um, the man, um, and they feel that it was the same man that they had seen playing with the children, you know, as the, the first uh, witness had seen. 
um, and the three kids approached this area. Um, the descriptions matched. And uh, the man asked um, the lady on the bench and then the couple on the bench, and also they had a granddaughter with her. Uh, the witnesses did, that couple did. Um, he asked them if they had seen anyone uh, interfering with his clothes. Um, he said he had some missing money from his clothes and they told him that they hadn't seen anything and the man went back to the three children. Um, the One of the women witnesses then, um, the one who was there with her husband, uh, the elderly lady, uh, she watched what was going on with the man and uh, the three Beaumont children and he was dressing the children. And uh, this witness thought that that was kind of strange, um, especially when this man pulled up um, the nine-year-olds, pulled up Jane's shorts over her bathing suit because, you know, a nine-year-old is, you know, able to do that themselves. Um, that's something also um, that was surprising to uh, Mrs. Beaumont, to the kid's mom. Uh, she, since Jane was known to be shy, um, the mom didn't think that, you know, she would let anyone do that. Uh, all the witnesses stated, though, that the kids were very friendly with this man. Um, after he was done dressing them, he picked up his pants and a towel, and they walked away, and that was the last that they were seen. Um, no, wait a second. They were seen after that. Okay, so this was the man. Then he went, I hope everyone can follow me on this. Um, he went to the changing rooms at the Collie Reserve, and it by this time it was about quarter after 12. Um, at about 1.45 that afternoon, um, oh, another witness, this is a different one, saw this man and the kids leaving the beach. And every single person, every single witness had the exact same description of the man and the same one of the children. Um, postman was also a witness and he was the last person to see the kids that day. Um, he was in the Jetty Road area and the kids were walking on a footpath near there. And um, Mr. Patterson is the name of the postman. And uh, whenever they saw him, they always would yell, it's the postie. Um, he said that when he saw the kids walking on the path, they were behaving normally and he did not see a man with them. So he was the first one to say that they're, you know, he, he, they weren't accompanied by a man. Um, this was toward the end of his postal route for the day. So he said that it was at a, either 1.45 or possibly at 2.55 p.m. Um, based on, you know, the different sightings, um, they feel that it was probably at 1.45. Um, later, the... Um, the kid's father ended up coming home. Um, I do know that he had thought about going to the beach with the kids that day, and that's something that really bothered him. Um, he debated on taking a day off of work and going with his children to the beach. You know, they were supposed to get on the bus, oh take gosh. the bus there, and then come back. Yeah. And that's not how it happened. Um, Dad went out looking for them. You know, I, they did a lot to try to find these kids. I'll put the name of the website in Skype. That's where I learn the most about this case sorry if it's kind of yeah. broken up i'm jumping around i'm looking on different pages here it's a really nice website and like i said earlier too this case is somewhat of a legend in australia you know there, there were no signs you know of the kids after that so um so he but he had that guy. feeling that he should should have done something and he didn't you know you well, know he had he had actually that morning he mm -hmm. he was debating if he should go to work or if he should go to the beach with his kids that day. Yeah. And instead of taking the day off, he ended up going to work. And can you imagine how Yeah, I'd be felt? kicking myself for it. I don't know if I'd still be alive right now, but, um, my Yeah, goodness. no kidding. Yeah. I mean, he must blame himself mm -hmm. so much, you know? Even though it, it's it's not his fault. Yeah, I mean, in, but, oh, wow. No, it's not. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really nice. I, I I don't know. I guess, you know, in this day and age, you wouldn't really find you know, a nine-year-old girl um, riding a bus and taking her seven-year-old sister and four-year-old brother along with her to go to the beach mm -hmm. or to be going in and out of stores for snacks or, you know, doing anything. I mean, it's just not done nowadays. 
you know, back at that time, though, I mean, obviously this was, you know, more common, you know, and kids at younger ages did things. I mean, I think about when I was younger and there was, you know, places I'd go riding my bike and stuff like that. Well, when I had my own kids, my kids weren't doing that at different ages. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they had to be a lot older before they were riding their bikes around the block and stuff. I was doing that by the time I was four or five, and I was allowed to. You know, you, I don't think you'd let your four or five-year-old do that. I didn't let mine. No. So, I mean, things are different now, and, you know, this did happen in 1966. So, you know, I, I feel really bad, you know, for this family and, and this dad especially because he must really live with a lot. Yeah, go on. So here's for that website. It's uh, okay. BeaumontChildren.com. Okay. So um, if let you me... want to share what you have now? Yeah, let me get that link up there. Okay, are you are you done? I thought you, it seemed like you had more you wanted to say. I kind of cut you off. Was there anything else? Um, No, not really. I, anyone that wants to read more about it, I'm, I mean, they, there's so many sections on, you know, the website here. They talk mm -hmm. more about the search than, you know, about the man that, you know, was seen, you know, possibly a suspect and um you know so there's really quite a bit on this website it's a nice website okay so anyone that and wants more information Beaumont if children I was to talk more we could go on for a long 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 time okay I can tell you already that this is going to be a definite redo with some priority um even, even though um you might not like what, what I'm going to tell you but um I, I I think that we should redo this let me while you were talking actually um I didn't want people sitting here staring at me, um, so I, I got the picture, enlarged the picture here. I have to manually change it. Okay. Um, okay. Um, the dream drawings uh, were done uh, January 12th of 2008. Um, the first one says underground ropes and barrel. Go to Silver City, Australia, and then the, there's the number 97. Uh, children were not together. Look again. Um, and then the second one says uh, broken hills fall, wire box, bodies are under rock. Uh, it was not here before. Um, I think that the unfortunately um, uh, the children look like they're they're deceased. Um, I'm, I'm, hopefully, I'm wrong, but um, that's what it looks like. And I think this is some type of construction or some some type of building that was built over the area that they were buried at. There's some type of apparently maybe new construction or something. Um, uh, wire wire box that actually might have something to do with when when you lay uh, when you lay concrete. Um, being either rebar or, or, or whatever might be down there. Um, okay, and, and that I only had two dream drawing, two dream drawings on that. And then the uh, uh, what I wrote down below the translation says that's all I can remember. But I did do a Google Earth search for Silver City, Australia, and Broken Hills Falls. Broken Hills Falls. Did not find either one. But oddly enough, there is a broken hill in Australia in a highway called Silver City. Um, it looks like it runs through it. Um, I, had, I'd made, I said I have copied my screen and it's below. I saw a number 79 and on my, and on my DD it said 97. Not sure if that means anything yet. Uh, I wrote, would be looking for some, side of, some sort of building with a jagged roof and some sort of wire mix box to it. Um, so that might have been um, a box next to it or as I was speculating here it might, it might have been something the uh, wire box or something where they were actually forming concrete. Um, it also says could be met next to a power transformer. Uh, sadly, I do not think these children are alive, um, and I do not remember seeing who did this, uh, but I do believe they're buried on some sort of rock or underneath a concrete floor. Um, and then below that, there is a location of Broken Hill, Australia, um, and it's a town, it's a pretty small town, but still it's not specific enough to get a, an address unless there was something that was recently built uh, in 2008, maybe around January. Um, there are some, some posts on this case. Um, there is a psychic, um, let's see, yeah, what's the psychic's name, Jan, Jan Van Shine, do you know what I'm talking about? That's someone that I'm not Okay, well, I'm, I'm just looking at the case file. Um, apparently the psychic said something, um, about where this, um, Jan, I think where Jan thought this, these, pe these children may be, um, and looking at that and some of the stuff that I found, I, I had noted that the psychic could be correct. Um, that's all in the case file. Um, and then there's some more information on Silver City, um, which is, uh, is basically, it says the name of a compound, 
of coagulated tin huts who, who, to which migrants of the late 40s and 50s were held for months. Um, and basically, I guess a prison. This this town used to be, or something like that. I'm I'm not exactly sure, but there is a a, a location. There's a town. Um, there's really not too many streets of the town, so maybe you know, definite redo on this one. Um, to see if we can get anything else. Deborah, do you have anything else? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, just that you know, we can try with that redo mm -hmm. based on you know the work you've done before and whatever you know we can come up with and come up with those specific questions. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at this. More detail to it. I was looking at the, at the at the comments. I think that the psyche could put out, or at least what uh, reports of the psyche said. In, in, in at the time, I felt that the psyche could have been uh, right um, as, as far as what I had got. Uh, at least at least we got apparently the same thing or something along those lines. Um, I'm not. I don't remember that, but I'm just reading off here. So um, I am not sure. Uh, where this psychic may be located, or if this psychic is still alive. Um, anyway, so we'll, we'll look into that, and uh, redo was, would definitely be in order. Kevin. Yes. Um, red car, 60s or 70s. Uh, it's a, the person in question is in his 60s or, 60s or 70s now. Something red, I think red car. That's that's it. That's all. All right, let's move on to our next case. Our next case is number five ninety eight. Let me get the graphic up real fast. All right, this is for uh, uh, Nancy um, Mac Duxton. Did I pronounce that correctly, Mac Duxton? Yes, he did. Okay. This is case number 598. Uh, it was requested to be opened by uh, Amy on uh, May 29th of 2007. Uh, case was opened uh, January 12th, 2008. Uh, Deborah, what information do we have for Nancy? Um, Nancy Jean McDuxton. She's been missing since August 11th, 2003 from Belmont, California. Her date of birth is November 4th, 1950. She was 52 years old at the time that she went missing. Uh, she'd be 58 right now, five feet, six inches tall, 125 pounds, Caucasian female, dark blonde hair, blue eyes. Um, she had chin length hair at the time that she went missing. She was last seen wearing blue jeans and a uh, light colored or denim coat and a bright pink sun hat. Uh, the last, uh, family member that saw her was her adult daughter and that was at their home in the 2000 block of Belmonte in Belmont California at about 8 30 in the morning um, when she left she had told her friends and family that she'd be shopping in Davenport California for the rest of the day they did see her shopping at a place called New Davenport cash store and restaurant at about 10 in the morning and she was seen again at the Davenport Post Office sometime between 1.30 and 3.30 p.m. that afternoon. Um, later on in the day, between 5.30 and 6.30, um, Nancy was seen again at the New Davenport Cash Store and Restaurant eating a vegetarian dinner with an unidentified man, and she appeared very happy. Uh, this man is described as being either Polynesian or Asian, salt and pepper hair, um, his age between late 30s and early 50s, about five feet, six inches tall and 160 pounds. Uh, he's not considered a suspect, but police you know, would like to identify him and talk to him. Um, it seemed that they had some sort of romantic relationship, uh, Nancy and this identified man. Uh, she was also seen at the Whale City Bakery sometime that day. Uh, her husband reported her missing the next day at nine in the morning. And uh, later on in the day in the afternoon, they located Nancy's minivan, a tan 2001 Mazda MPV, California license plate 4POG552. It was abandoned near some cliffs and a beach on Highway 1 near Davenport. Uh, that's in northern Santa Cruz County. 
uh, and that's about five miles north of the Davenport Cash Store and Restaurant that she was seen twice at. She had bought gifts that day and they were locked inside of her van. And um, let's see. Okay, they found no trace of Nancy in that area, but they did find some of her belongings in that general area. Um, investigators found a folding chair, a blanket. Uh, there was a book, and the title of that book is In a Sunburned, Co In a Sunburned Country, uh, written by Bill Bryson, which is about traveling to Australia. Uh, they found her sunglasses, and they found the bright pink sun hat. And that was near Greyhound Rock, and that's about a hundred, and that was located about a hundred yards from her van. Um, they think that she was sitting on the beach reading. Um, they say that Nancy had made some long-term arrangements um, before she'd gone missing. Uh, she'd done this um, at her workplace for her job. Um, they don't. They did not suspect foul play in her disappearance and they thought that she left on her own. She was not having problems in her life as far as um, at home or at work. And um, she did have a young granddaughter. Her family didn't think that she would, you know, decide to go missing on her own and leave the young granddaughter behind. Um, they have done some looking for Nancy in Australia uh, based on the fact that she was reading that book and that seems to be the last thing that they, you know, they knew what she was doing. Um, they also considered suicide because there's cliffs near where they found her van. And, you know, that, that you know, based on the location of the van and cliffs, that would be a logical, you know, thought for them to investigate. Uh, there was, they did use a tracking dog and they tracked her scent to the edge of the cliff but she does not have history of depression or any type of mental problems to suggest that she would commit suicide. Um, she was the director of the Carlmont Parent Nursery School in Belmont, California at the time that she went missing. And a large part of her life revolved around her work. Uh, they say that she was very organized, very dedicated, and she was a nature lover. She did like to explore back roads and isolated type areas. Um, she had been living in the Belmont area since 1979, and she had two grown children at the time that she went missing, a grown daughter and a grown son. Uh, what do you have on this case, Brian? Uh, thanks, Deborah. Um, let's see. Um, all right, the, the dream drawings from, uh, actually, it's from the night of uh, January 11th, 2008. Uh, first one says uh, the number 316 and then the equal sign, 315. Dots of light, O-R-A, uh, uppercase letters, I believe. 39-year-old um, uh, um, white male, uh, black mask over face. Uh, second one says, uh, two-room beach house, she's alive. Uh, large glass window, San Marta, Mexico. Um, then it says, I believe she was taken by a man wearing a dark face mask to a beach house in Mexico. Uh, maybe a place called San Marta. Google San Marta, Mexico, and nothing came up. Um, so I did that, um, and there was a response back um, s saying that there's a uh, San Marta, Baja, California uh, location. There's, there's several maps that are posted. Actually, there's only one map, I'm sorry, posted on the case file. Um, so what, what I have so far, just looking at this, would be that she uh, was probably, um, could be the, a victim of human trafficking. Uh, kidnapped or, or, or whatever for whatever reason um, I did not have a uh, drawing of, of uh, uh, anybody that um, may have taken her I do see that there's a there's a uh, person wanting for questioning a, a diagram of that person um, and um, that's all I got um, fortunately I mean it did say uh, she's alive um, and and but unfortunately there's really not enough information here to do anything with so i guess a redo would be in order on this one as well what do you think i agree okay kevin i get um someone or something has uh, 
initially took her. And that's all I can get. That's, that's it. Okay, let's move on to our final case of, of the night. It's case number 599. Uh, this is this is Mohammed uh, Mori. Um, Deborah, we don't have a picture for this person, do we? No, we don't. Okay, uh, that's fine. Um, the case was requested to I be opened. Okay, it was requested uh, to be open, to, to be opened by Anika um, on January twelfth of two thousand eight. Um, did not get to it until. Well, I guess the next day. Um, could be a typo, but either, either way, um, yeah, the dream drawings uh, were done uh, on uh, January 12th of 2008. Deborah, what information do we have? Um, this is actually one of those cases um, looking for a killer. Okay. And um, Mohammed Amori was I gotta eight figure, years I gotta, old. I got to fix something then. Okay, go ahead. He was eight years old at the time, and there was someone else that was also killed. Um, when she was 56 years old, her name was Anna Lena Svensson. Um, that happened in October of 2004, I believe. Um, they were, well, Mohana was on his way to school. I believe the lady was on his way to, on her way to work. Um, he was on his way to school when he um, he was violently stabbed, and uh, the lady, Anna, um, she was near her apartment building and on her way to work. This happened in Sweden. Um, Mohammed died at the scene, and uh, Anna died later on in the hospital. Um, the person who did this awful, awful crime, um, that's who we're looking for, that's who needs to be found, and... Um, he left behind his his own bloodstained clothes. Um, the investigators think that um, he seriously injured his own right hand while he was doing this. Um, they do have DNA samples from the clothing and also from um, what they refer to as a butterfly knife that they found shortly after uh, the murders took place. Uh, there has not been a whole lot done in the last couple of years here. In fact, um, they did actually um, arrest a man. Um, he was a Polish citizen, and um, they arrested him for the murders. And to begin with, he um, refused to give a blood sample for DNA testing. And so, you know, that fueled, you know, in the media, uh, speculating that he was, in fact, the killer. Um, he was forced by court order to provide the blood sample, and it turned out that he did not match. He was released, um, and that was back in March of 2005. And, you know, I did do some looking, um, trying to find something more current, and I can't find anything more current as far as where the investigation is, nor can I find um, anything that they've caught this person. So, um, what do you have on this one? <clears throat> uh, thanks, Deborah. I, I just updated uh, to reflect um, th um, that this person's killer. Um, what it says is uh, the first one, uh, the first dream drawing says, 19-year-old uh, uh, Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-E, -E, uh, dash, dash, and then the letter of the, the word Flynn, F-L-E-N, number 47, works at tax office. Um, there's some symbols up here I do not recognize. They might be a foreign language or some type of other symbols like that that uh, may, be, may be on this building. Uh, there's a drawing of a building here, and um, to me, that the bottom left looks like the death symbol. Um, certainly hope it's not. Anyways, the next one says, uh, Light Sparks O-H-O, -O, um, in the in notes it might be a last name, uh, had Balisons, B-A-L-L-Y-S-O-N-S, and then the question mark. Um, before it, it before it's in home, uh, this doesn't make it much sense. But I'm gonna just read it. Comma wall, uh, and then the word r r r u r, and it says again maybe a name. 61 year old scar. There's a drawing of a, of a man. Uh, looks like he has glasses uh, with a scar on his right cheek. Um, 
you know, some other things that's not not noted here either. Uh, up at the top left hand corner it says light, um, and there's, it looks like a pointing to like a star or something like that. The bottom left, the, the, if you look at the first dream drawing on the bottom left hand side, that is some type of symbol. A lot of times I do get when I get the, the death feeling. It's actually a wonderful feeling. I think I talked about that before, but um, I'm hoping that's not what that is. Um, but other than that, I don't, I don't see anything here. Um, and there was no uh, no other translations given. Um, so I think um, maybe we know we owe a Nika uh, Nika uh, redo on this one too, because I don't think anybody's really paying attention to this case. What do you think, Deborah? Um, no, um, not even investigators paying attention to this one at this point. And, you know, sadly, an eight-year-old little boy and a 56-year-old woman were murdered. And, and this has gone on. I, it happened in October of 2004. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're a good four and a half years since this has happened with no right. resolution. The case is from Sweden? Yes. Okay, we don't have too many cases from Sweden, do we? Mm, no, it's like you the don't. first one, isn't it? I think so, yeah. Okay. All right, anything else for this case? Um, I don't have anything else. Okay, Kevin? <coughs> Excuse me. He's very angry. Feels they deserve to die. Obviously, unjustified death, but... The perpetrator is still alive and has quite possibly done this to other people, maybe not murder them, but have harmed them because they have made him mad. Uh, the person definitely has severe anger issues and he may be caught soon for a similar event or something to that effect, that is all. Okay, Kevin, um, thank you. Serial killer, possibly? This sounds like what you're describing. This, you can come out of your thing. This is this is all our cases, too. He's, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't say serial killer. I would just think that if you piss him off, then... Uh, he will find a way uh, to do something back to you tenfold. What he thinks, you know, is something that makes him mad, then even though you may not think he's mad, something to that effect. Okay. I'm back. Thank you, Kevin. Well. Okay, um, anything else? Deborah? Anybody? Uh, I don't have anything um, except uh, the usual. Yep, he's already up on the screen. Go ahead. You, you got him this time, Deborah. Um, <laughs> Aji Desir, six years old. He's been missing since January 10th of this year. Um, to learn more about what has happened with Aji, uh, you can visit Find Aji, and that's A D. JI.com. Uh, you can print a poster, uh, get his photo out there to more people. Please share uh, his photo and um, information about him being missing with everyone that you know. And um, also, you could um, do a lot of good by promoting awareness for um, Cynthia Macklin. She's been missing since January 28th. Of this year from Bakewood, Texas. Um, you can learn more at findcindy.com. And um, we're asking everyone to please email the media uh, in Texas and at the national level to get some more awareness for her case. You'll find uh, links for the contact pages for Texas media and for national media at findcindy.com. Uh, another one would be findjessie.com. Uh, Jessica Edith Louise Foster has been missing since March 29th of 2006. She went missing in North Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, she's originally from um, Canada. Um, at findjessie.com, you can learn more about Jessie's case and about human trafficking. Um, her mom, Glendine Grant, uh, does a lot of work 
to get more awareness um, for Jesse and for others that are missing. And that's all. Thanks. Um, this is a picture of, of, of Haley Cummings. Um, uh, that story seems to have dropped from the media, too. Have you noticed that, Deborah? It's all on the uh, Kayla Anthony trial, or Casey Anthony trial. Anyways, this is a picture of Haley Cummings. Um, and here's just another case. Uh, this is Madeline McCann. Uh, she's still missing, too. Um, so that said, uh, uh, you know, please keep looking, guys. Please post. Um, um, do whatever you think you can, you can do to help. Uh, we will, too. Uh, thank, thank you, uh, Kevin, and thank you uh, again, Deborah. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Okay, and we'll see you tomorrow night, uh, uh, eight o'clock um, Eastern Standard Time, minus five uh, GMT on Missing Persons TV. Good night.